Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 28th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what is the dispute between the Dunleavy administration and the legislature's Ledge Finance Division over so-called, quote, designated close quote general funds really about? Second, is the end of the Alaska recession really on its way, as some economists predict? We don't think it is. And third, in our view, where is Representative Gary Knopp really trying to lead the Alaska legislature in his standoff with other House Republicans? And now, let's join Michael. Uh, continuing now with Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, organization dedicated to, well, just that, creating sustainable budgets and helping to formulate sustainable budgets for the state of Alaska. He comes on every week to give us his weekly top three, which is the top three items that he thinks Alaskans should be talking about in, you know, in helping to form those sustainable budgets. Brad and I were just talking about uh, the... Uh, uh, the the articles in the various news outlets over the presentation by Donna Arduin, the OMB director, and David Teal, the finance director, and uh, some of the, uh, as I was saying, some of the snark in this. Um, and uh, so, Brad, I mean, I got a little worked up there in that first segment. Um, I mean, am I wrong, or what? What, what are your thoughts on uh, on this? We, we're moving around. We moved your top two into the top one. Uh, I guess uh, not my intention, but here, there we are. <laughs> well, so this is the debate about that's going on in the legislature, was going on during Arguing's uh, uh, testimony about the difference between DGF, designated general funds, and UGF, unrestricted general funds. And there's there's quite a bit of subtext uh, that's going on in, uh, in this debate. Designated general funds, the only difference between designated general funds and, and unrestricted general funds is that designated general funds have a statute that essentially say you will use this pot of money uh, for this purpose or have statute or have some sort of practice behind them that says you will use this money uh, for this purpose. And, and the big example, and, and designated general funds is about $840 million, uh, at least in the FY20 uh, proposed budget. The big chunk of that, and, and a good example of that, is university tuition. Right. Uh, tuition paid by university students. Uh, it's about three hundred and uh, some odd million dollars. Uh, about a less, well, more than a third, about forty percent of the total DGF university tuition paid by students under the statute is designated back to the university to be used by the university in support um, of its budget, and so. Basically, DGF is, is setting aside things that, that the legislature or the, the statutes say uh, should go uh, to a certain purpose. They're trying to take those funds out of the UGF so you don't get a situation where somebody says, well, we get all this money from tuition. Let's use that to you know, increase the number of state troopers, for example, to use it for different purposes. But the subtext in here is that there's some things hidden in DGF that are sort of sacred cows of certain uh, legislators. A good example of that is PCE, uh, power cost equalization funds, uh, that are used to subsidize uh, power costs in the bush uh, by taking a certain portion of revenues uh, that are coming from oil, frankly, and setting them aside and using those to subsidize uh, power costs uh, out in the bush. That is a sacred cow or a, or a special interest of 
Lyman Hoffman, and Senator Lyman Hoffman, who's on uh, Senate Finance uh, this session, as he has been a, a long number of sessions in the past. Uh, and it's something that Lyman goes out of his way to protect. One of the ways he's protected it uh, is to put power cost equalization funds in DGF. Right. And so they're sort of they're sort of taken out of the general fund, uh, sort of you know taken off, taken out of the general fund, put in the, put on the shelf for for PCF. Other things in there, for example, are funds that go to Votech. Uh, there's some fees um, and tuitions that are paid uh, with respect to Votech. Uh, activities and they are put a for they're put aside and put in DGF. That that and some other workforce labor issues uh, are a uh, uh, special uh, uh, sacred cow for Click Bishop. And then you, you sort of go through these senators and they all have their sacred cows. Um, <clears throat> Marine, uh, there's a, 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 a set aside for the Marine Highway System from funds that are coming from the Marine Highway System, fifty two million dollars. That's important to Senator Gary Stevens. So you go you go through the, the DGF and you see these sort of sacred cows that are that are set aside. And I think what legislators, I think the subtext of what's going on here is legislators are concerned that these funds are going to be instead of being set on the shelf and, and not really discussed, just automatically flowed through. By putting them in UGF, you're going to have this full on debate about. Well, is the marine highway system really more? Are these funds for the marine highway system really more important? Are these funds for Votech really more important? Is PCE uh, really more important than other expenditures, for example, for additional state troopers? Um, and 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 legislators see this process uh, in part as as revealing some of the sacred cows right. uh, that they've set up. It's an attack. Uh, and, it's it's an attack on their personal piggy banks, is what it is. Um, but I think the and I think the bigger point in this, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think the bigger point in this, since you've mentioned the power cost equalization, the higher uh, education and higher the endowment fund and things like that, is these have also been used as pools of money to be able to fund other projects when they wanted to hide it out of the UGF. This is thing that's going on kind of behind closed doors, out of sight, unless you're super wonkish on the budget. You don't see it because you're not paying attention to page five of the report. You're looking at the front page. Yeah, exactly right. And and, and frankly, that's gone on uh, under both Republican and uh, and Democrat control. One of the kings of doing that, of running funds around, was was when Mark Newman uh, from Wasilla was the co-chair of House Finance. Newman one year just did all sorts of things uh, between DGF and UGF in order to be able to say at the end of it that he got the operating budget down to a certain number, down to 4.2, I think it was 4.2 or 4.3 at the time, a uh, billion dollars. And, and to do that, he just stuffed a bunch of expenses over into DGF and had DGF cover it, so you can say that, that that the UGF was was had been reduced. So yeah, it's it, it is it, it's used for that purpose as well to hide things. Here's the big irony, though, Michael, and the one that I, I was I I just I, it just stuns me every time this whole UGF DGF thing comes up. What's really the biggest DGF, the biggest designated fund uh, when you look at the statutes? It's the permanent fund dividend. Right. Uh, the, the permanent, the statutes are clear that that a portion of the permanent fund earnings stream is designated, to use their word, designated uh, to the permanent fund dividend. It is it is the same sort of statutory structure that you have for PCE, uh, for example, and the same sort of statutory structure you have for for a bunch of others of these designated funds. But the legislators. Um, uh, Two years ago, three years ago, started counting the permanent fund dividend as UGF, as unrestricted general fund, and saying, oh, all those permanent fund dividend monies, well, they're in UGF, and so we can use them to fund state troopers or to fund K-12 education. They're not really really part of the designated general fund. When, in fact, when you look at the Legislative Finance Division's own definition of designated funds, when in fact those permanent fund dividends should be over in the DGF category. So it's not just it's not just the games that they're playing to hide things over in DGF um, uh, to to take them off the table and take them out of public view. It's sort of the reverse of transport, transparency, take them out of public view of of how they're of how they're using those funds. 
they're playing the reverse games. The legislators are playing reverse games to think to take money out of DGF that should be, that should be in DGF, like the permanent fund dividend, and throw it into UGF uh, uh, when they don't when they don't like that statutorily designated purpose uh, to be able to use it for other things. So this is it, it's it, it there's a whole subtext going on in this debate between UGF and DGF. Um, it's not it's not transparency, as Senator Stedman tried to say it was. It's not the concern about transparency. It's actually the reverse. It's the concern about, oh, my God, you're going to shine the light and, and, <laughs> and expose these funds that we've spent so much time setting aside. You're going to expose them to this competition uh, for uh, for other state uses. And how about that? And how about that analogy by David Teal of the monopoly money and the potato chips and all that? I mean, talk about obfuscation. I mean, talking about getting down into the weeds on things that, you know, most people don't care and don't understand about the basics of it. Instead of overviewing it and making it understandable for everybody, it's more obfuscation, uh, really, uh, on the part of the legislative finance director, in my opinion. Um, I understand what he was trying to do, but really it just looked like you were trying to blow cover uh, on what was going on. Yeah, David, I mean, David certainly, <laughs> one of the things I did chuckle at, one of the articles said, you know, David is the is the um, uh, 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 non-political, impartial, you know, observer of what goes on in the budget. He, he's anything <laughs> but, I mean, David has his own drivers. One of them is to get the permanent fund dividend uh, into the general fund and let it be used uh, uh, to, to help support uh, programs other than the permanent fund dividend. And in fact, it's his, he and, 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 and the OMB director under the Walker administration were the two that made the decision to reclassify the permanent fund dividend out of DGF or frankly, out of other, which is where I think they had it before, and put it into the UGF and all of a sudden say, hey, look at this new pot of money we got. Um, it, I mean, David really ha- does have an agenda, and and he, you may agree with his agenda or disagree with his agenda, but he clearly has an agenda on how he on how he wants to run things down there. And, and that agenda is to give more money to state government and to let them – Uh, continue to spend more and sort of give them cover on how they're doing it so to say he was he was impartial and he was just trying to you know uh in a in an impartial way or a non-political way you know talk about what what arguing was doing is is just baloney well he was was truly he was truly trying to give give the legislators cover for these little pots of money they've said oh yeah absolutely well mike shower said it yesterday on the program he said you know multiple times throughout his presentation uh you know david teal would say uh, i'm non-political i'm non-political but here's how you should do it here's what you should do he goes it was pretty amazing stuff um so brad i don't want to run the clock out too long here brad keithley's our guest by the way alaskans for sustainable budgets um but the long and the short of it is more transparency or less transparency in when they're presenting it to the public and in general overview, they combine UGF and DGF numbers. Because, I mean, I watched the whole thing and I went back and rewatched it when I started reading the news reporting on it because I wanted to be sure that I didn't miss it. She never said she would strip DGF and they couldn't see it and everything else, but talking about it in generalized Per, you know, uh, presentation format so that people could understand it. They were combining the numbers. Everybody else acted like they were going to try and hide stuff from the legislature, which uh, to me was not the case. What are your thoughts on this? More transparent, less transparent? Uh, was I wrong? Were they wrong? Where, where do you fall on this? Well, the trans. What's important about transparency is you know the source of the funds, so you know. That 330 million, for example, of what you're dealing with in the funds are coming from the university. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter if you classify that as DGF or UGF. You just need to know that that 330 million is coming from the university. And 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 there's nothing that Arguin said, or nothing the administration said that's going to hide that. They're still going to come with these line items that you know where the stuff's coming from. The DGF, I mean, stripping DGF, the DZ, DGF designation off this stuff particularly if they're going to do it with the permanent fund dividend, I think that actually increases transparency. I think now you're going to have you're going to have Lyman having to defend PCE on its own as opposed to saying, well, that's just, G- G- just DGF. We don't have to talk about that. Um, and, and I think I think that actually is going to increase transparency in the process. I will say this. 
when the administration came with their supplemental yesterday, their, their FY19 supplemental yesterday, they did break it down into D, DGF and UGF. Um, and so I don't know if they're if they're reversing or or if they're just going to you know use those categories just to avoid continued debates like this. Uh, but but what's really important is I think is is continuing to have those line items, knowing where the, that money's coming from. They're not going to change that. If you're not changing that, then you're still going to have the same transparency you had before. You're just taking away from legislators when you eliminate the DGF designation. You're just taking away from legislators the ability to hide these pots. If they're still going to have DGF, however, then they need to put the permanent fund dividend back in DGF and stop playing games about moving it over to, selecting it to move over to UGF. It's good, good for the goose, good for the gander. Either put the, either put the PFD back in DGF where it belongs or just strip out DGF and let everything fight for itself. Right. Well, and again, I never took it that they would hide the origin, uh, you know, the origination of the money. The origin that they, you know, that that they would always say the money was coming from here, but that in full presentation format, when they said this is what the total expenditures were, they would combine the two numbers so that people could understood. Because I thought one of the most telling charts in everything that Arduin did was when she said, here's a six, I think it was a six or seven year run of UGF and DGF spending combined. And you could see that the UGF numbers were going down. They went down pretty significantly. And yet the DGF numbers increased over a five-year period by 80 percent and when you look at that you go oh well that's where some of that money is going uh people just didn't you know people just don't understand because like i said they're not paging over to page four or five where the dgf numbers are they were looking at the you know unrestricted general fund spending that their legislators are pointing to saying see look at what a good job we did in cutting the budget uh not understanding that there was more to it than just that. And I think that's an important distinction that really none of the news media is really pointing out, that it was a lot of the games that were being played that I think had forced the administration to bring this to the forefront. Um, well, it, and I think the administration is bringing it to the forefront, frankly, because they, they do want this total discussion about we've got this much money We've got this much expenditures. How do you want to spend the money we've got against against the ex- expenditures? And I think the administration is basically saying things like PCE they need to compete, yeah, uh, uh, with uh, with uh, with everything else, yeah, uh, for for you know for, for for appropriations. Yeah, no, I agree totally. Brad Keithley is our guest. Brad, what do you think of my analysis of uh, of uh, the? That the fear, and, and I think you've kind of touched on it a little bit, but just for clarification's sake, my analysis of the fear of these legislators that now the governor, because uh, the panic in that room was almost palpable as you watch this and some of the shrillness, Von Imhoff and, and Willikowski and, and Chip uh, Click Bishop, uh, you know, they're in there and all of a sudden they realized that they were going to have to, if they wanted to put some of their pet projects back in that they were going to actually have to stand in front of the public and explain why they were going to put these monies back in, in light of an election that basically people said, we want a smaller government. Um, I think that there was some true, I think there was some true angst in there over that. Well, there, there is, I mean, let's take PCE again as an example. Lyman's done a masterful job over the decades, decades of, of, Calling away this money. There's something like a billion dollars in the PCE of endowment fund. It's it's a high number. I don't want to. I'm, I'm not sure it's a billion, but he's got he's he's put away a high number in this endowment fund. That's generating this return, sort of like the permanent fund does um, each year. That's that's then dedicated to, to you know sort of his pet projects, PCE and and community revenue sharing. I think comes out of that as well anymore, or at least a portion of it does. Um, and he spent a lot of time, you know, tucking this away, and 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 the thought that now it's going to just the, that money is now going to be floated back into the general fund, um, and he's not going to have this sort of procedural trick uh, uh, hold up uh, to just sort of tuck it away immediately and not and not really have it up for debate. I think that does create fear because you know. Now he's going to have to explain all over again. He's sort of done it in increments over the years, but now he's got to explain all over again to, to urban Alaska that, uh, hey, you know, Bush, the Bush is getting the subsidy for their electricity costs. 
there's valid reasons why why it's there. I mean, he's made good arguments over the years, but he's going to have to explain it again in the context of of a situation where we've got a 1.6 billion dollar shortfall. And it's and and this argument about you know their argument that well it's taking away transparency to make these two funds that's just I, I about spit out my coffee when I was I know, when I was listening I know. to that and, and reading it. It's the exact reverse. Exactly. They want to hide this stuff away. Click Click's got his own, you know, he's got the workforce development. He was commissioner of labor uh, under Palin, and he's been, you know, long been active uh, in, in in labor development issues or the development of, of, of the labor workforce. And so he's got, you know, his, he's got his own little uh, piece tucked away. And, and there's, you go through, and the, and the marine highway system's got their own piece, little, little piece tucked away. So you go through it. And you see all of these little pots that they've created over time, all these little, you know, set asides that they've created all the time. All of a sudden, you know, the potential that it's being that it's going to be exposed, and they're going to have to redefend it all over again in the context of 1.6 billion dollar. Yeah, there was the, the 1.6 billion dollar shortfall. Yeah, there was there was concern in that room, serious concern. Yeah, no, the panic was real. I mean, it was really a I mean, click, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, uh, yeah, just the just the comments were just like, whoa, man, somebody done poked the bear uh, on this. The hornet's nest is riled up, and you could see it. But, I mean, the, go ahead. But, but the the irony of this, the irony that it, if you're if you're going to go down the DGF category, there is no greater DGF than the permanent fund yeah. dividend. There yeah. is no clearer statute on set aside than the permanent fund dividend. The irony of these guys saying. And women saying, you know, you can't do that because it's going to expose my, you know, my PCE side. Uh, and then the irony of saying, but at the same time, oh my gosh, that permanent fund dividend, oh, that's general funds. You right. know, we get to use that for anything. That's not a, that's not a set aside. That the, the 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 inconsistency of that is just amazing. Right. So I, it, it's going to be fun if if the administration continues on down this road of just you know, exposing it all in UGF, treating it all as, as one fund source or one general fund source. Uh, the, 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 the humor of, fall, of, of watching these guys try to defend their set-asides at the same time as they're trying to use PFDs as UGF funds is just going to be – going to be enter, the enter, entertainment value is going to be high. Hey, continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, we're in his weekly top three. We need to quickly jump into uh, the number two, which is all about the economy. The Alaska Journal of Commerce, Brad, had an article out saying, oh, the recession, the recession, don't worry. It's over now. You can, everybody can breathe a sigh of relief. It'll be fine. Um, I am not quite so uh, positive, but as I just said, I'm not an economist, nor do I play one on TV. So uh, let's see what uh, what you have to say on this. Well, the key the key to any economic analysis is to is to sort of immediately leap to the assumptions and see what assumptions that uh, uh, that the uh, that the economist or the analysis is making in order to, to reach the conclusions, and and it is absolutely key to do that with uh, with with the analysis that uh, that the that the Alaska Journal of Commerce and some other publications have been talking about uh, with this economic. Uh, economic analysis on where the recession is. The key to the, to the assumption that the recession is ending in Alaska is that we somehow paper over this $1.6 billion deficit uh, and continue to fund it uh, in a way that doesn't affect uh, the economy uh, any more than it has been in the past. So, for example, um, uh, one of the things that uh, one of the economists said is an assumption is that the legislature doesn't cut uh, any more state spending doesn't cut any more state employees doesn't have any more uh, reduction in state employees um, and and then we're working our that, that's part of the assumption behind working our way uh, through the recession well I don't know how I don't know how we're going to do that um, uh, and and paper over the 1.6 billion dollars the, the the way the, the 1.6 billion dollar deficit the Dunleavy administration is going to come with a proposal they've said that will cut uh, 1.6 billion dollars out of spending. You're not going to be able to do that without cutting people. If you make cuts to people, uh, that's going to have uh, that's going to undercut the assumption in the in the analysis, and it's going to uh, uh, further uh, the recession. If you if you cover that 1.6 billion dollars 
uh, by uh, continuing to take money from the PFD, or as some legislators are proposing, to take even more from the PFD, take even more out of the private sector through PFD cuts uh, in order to fund government, uh, then you're going to uh, then you're going to be reducing money that's in the private sector. That's going to have a knock-on effect on uh, on employment. Uh, and that's going to uh, uh, under, undercut one of the assumptions in the uh, uh, in the analysis. If you if you cover the the PF or if you cover the spending shortfall, if you don't cut uh, the 1.6 billion dollar uh, out of out of government, uh, and you have to fund it out of the economy in some other way through a flat tax, as you and I have talked about, uh, then that's going to take money out of the private sector, move it over to the government sector, and that's going to have an effect. Uh, that's not that's not factored into the uh, to the analysis. The only way that analysis sort of fits all of the assumptions is if we continue to fund government uh, through uh, drawdowns on the fiscal reserves, um, and and then you're just really moving the recession. Right. Uh, given where we've gotten now, you're just really moving the recession. Because if, for example, you take an additional 1.6 billion dollars out of the earnings reserve account over and above the amount required for PFD and over the amount that the, the, the other 50 percent that goes to government, if you take that 1.6 billion dollars out of the earnings reserve, you're not going to have an immediate fe- effect on the economy, and maybe then their analysis uh, uh, is valid. But all you've done is you've knocked down the investment base uh, in the permanent fund, and you've reduced the future flow. Uh, of funds, future PFDs and future flows to government. And so you've sort of transferred the recession from this generation to future generations that are going to feel the effects uh, of that reduced uh, earnings coming from the permanent fund. So you've got to, you've got to look at the assumptions, and I, and I don't think the assumptions are going to hold up. I think there is going to be, uh, at least the Dunleavy administration is going to propose significant reductions to government, which are going to have the effect of, uh, of some layoffs. Uh, some reductions in force uh, in government. Uh, if they don't do it that way, I think that I think the legislature is going to do it either through continued PFD cuts uh, or through uh, uh, increased PFD cuts, uh, and that's going to have an effect on the private sector that sort of knocks down the the assumptions that the that the economists are making on the uh, on the private sector. So I'm in a perfect world where you know we have this sort of free money hanging out there. Uh, in, a, in a fiscal reserve, as we've as we've used the last seven years by pulling down the SBR and the CBR, uh, where that money is not really going into the economy currently, and they're just pulling it out uh, to support the current economy at the expense of future at the expense of future generations. In a perfect world where we continue to use sort of that free money, uh, then yes, we may be we, we might be uh, uh, coming into a situation where we're uh, where we're nearing the end of the recession. But we just don't have that free world anymore. I mean, right. we've, we've used up all all of the earnings reserve or all of the fiscal reserves, and and as I say, if we start going into the earnings reserve account, we're just taking the money out of future generations and just transferring the recession from this generation to future generations. Yep, eating the seed corn, as it were. Brad Keithley's our guest. Uh, we're talking about his weekly top three. I can really add any more to what you just said because I'm in total agreement with it. And we're down to the last four or five minutes. So let's talk about your number three, which I think is important. Gary Knopp continues to be the stumbling block inside the House of Representatives in getting this this uh, majority formed. His reasoning is, of course, he doesn't want just a 21 majority because then there would be a stumbling block. His answer instead is to have a 12-12 split between uh, Republicans and Democrats because that wouldn't be a hurdle at all to getting anything done. Your thoughts on what's going on with Knopp? Well, Knopp, this is really this is really um, has sort of brought forward the whole debate about PFD cuts uh, and about whether how the legislature is going to deal with our fiscal situation. If you read Knopp's uh, recent editorial, uh, it's been in the Peninsula Clarion, it's been in, in other papers. Uh, about halfway down, he says this: these are the principles that he's that he says his his bipartisan. Uh, coalition would 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 focus on during the first session of the 31st legislature. All members would agree to the to the following terms, and the first two terms are key. First, no changes to the state's oil and gas tax credits. So that really takes out changing the oil and gas tax system as a way of helping to fund the shortfall. And the second, no broad based tax proposals such as a state income or sales tax. All right. 
Well, he also says, I mean, basically in there that the that the that the coalition wouldn't agree to would be one that would not be in alignment to reduce a government by one point six billion dollars. So what he said is, we're not going to cut spending much. We're not going to change the oil and gas tax system much or at all, and we're not going to have broad-based tax proposals such as state income or sales tax. Guess what that leaves right. um, as the funding source? More PFD uh, cuts. And it is continu- I'm sorry? More PFD cuts, right. Right, exactly. Uh, continued PFD cuts or even more PFD cuts. That's the only funding source that's left after you make, after you make all those conditions. So this isn't really about – this, this whole debate is not really about, um, you know, whether we need to have a, a kumbaya coalition where everybody comes together and, you know, all works together for the benefit of the state versus, oh, this partisan, you know, Republican uh, uh, coalition that might, do, that, that might do bad things. This isn't about that. This is really about state finances. Are, if, you, if you go down Canops Road, you're agreeing in advance, essentially, to PFD cuts. There's no other way around uh, once you take all of his conditions in, you're agreeing to PFD cuts. Um, and so people who are resisting that, the Republicans in the, in the, in the House, are really saying, look, we, want, we don't want to go down that road. We want to consider the, uh, the cuts that the Dunleavy administration is going to come with. And at the end, we don't want to have pre-committed the PFD cuts by agreeing to these things that you're taking off the table. So, yeah. I, you know, there's, there's a lot of surface debate going on about whether you're a good guy or a bad guy, whether you're a partisan or you're, yep. you're, you know, you're bipartisan. Brad, but at the end, it's all about the money. Yep, and that's, that's the point. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. I mean, I couldn't agree more with you on this. And when I get back, um, uh, and I want you to comment on this, but when I get back to the radio, I'm going to dig into his comments a little deeper because – uh, again, this idea that this is all about fairness and bipartisanship and everything else. Uh, I mean, there are a couple key points here. One that I think Eastman makes is uh, that when he's talking about um, uh, when he's talking about Knopf shopping this list around, that on each and every version of this caucus membership list that he's been circulating, Gary Knopp is on it. So first of all, it's a power play. Second of all, I totally agree with you that this is all about maintaining the status quo and not reducing the size and scope of government. I mean, Knopp really played his hand in that first interview with Kitcherman, where he basically says there'll be those of you out there who are supporting the governor's agenda, and there'll be those like me and on my side who will be over here uh, standing against it. I. I mean, that, that said it all right there. He's already played his hand. He is doing exactly just what you're saying there. Everything about maintaining the status quo, keeping government the size that it is, and basically taking the monies from the permanent fund, uh, permanent fund dividend rather, to then fund those things. And, uh, and I think that is directly at odds with what his constituency and the rest of the state as a majority is looking for. Yeah, well, it's certainly at odds with what uh, people voted for with with Dunleavy. I mean, they voted to maintain the PFD, restore the PFD, um, and voted for uh, uh, cut some cuts to government. You can argue about how much Mike really talked about cuts during the campaign, but they voted for at least some some cuts to government. So it is it is undermining uh, the agenda that the state as a whole voted for uh, in, in electing Dunleavy as as governor. I, I, to tell you the truth, Michael, I'm not sure this gets resolved. Um, until and, and I'm not sure what we're going to do in the meantime, but I'm not sure this gets resolved until deep in the session because this really is, this really is the inflection point in the House about whether you're going to do PFD cuts or not. You can't agree to to Knopf's terms and then say, oh, we're going to restore the full PFD. There's just no room left uh, left to do that. So you know anybody who joins that coalition. Essentially, is saying, uh, "Yep, I'm I'm all ready for for PFD cuts," and I think I think that debate's over um, uh, in the House. And then you got the Senate, who will go that direction in any event. I think I think I think that's done. So the people in the House who are resisting this, I think, see the end game that Knopf's up to with respect to the PFD and with respect to government funding. And I think this is really sort of a masked fight about the about the fiscal's. Uh, about the, the fiscal policy that this legislature is going to adopt, the House is going to adopt, sort of put into this, into the into the form of this personality thing uh, of Knopf saying, you know, he's better than everybody else, and he's going to, you know, be be 
have a better coalition than than the, than the House Republicans are going to have. And and they're not ready to to resolve the fiscal issues. I don't think the House is ready to resolve the fiscal issues, and I'm not sure they can get this resolved until until they've come to grips with those fiscal issues. So it's going to be. I, I, if I were if looking at it right now, I think this stretches out a, a fairly long time, and it's sort of a fundamental fight. Now, how's the House going to function in the meantime? How are they going to hold committee hearings? How are they going to, you know, actually get stuff done? I'm not sure, uh, but but agreeing to con- agreeing to the coalition that Knopf's trying to build um, is just going to send them down a track that uh, uh, I, I don't think a lot of the Republicans. Uh, in, in the House coalition, hopefully most of the Republicans in the House coalition uh, want to go down from a fiscal policy standpoint. Uh, Brad Keithley, our guest here on the Michael Duke Show, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. There's links up in the top of the chat room there for his page. I suggest you go like it and then set it to uh, uh, first in feed so that you could see his comments and uh, posts on Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, Brad, I'm really concerned. I'm still, I'm concerned on a couple levels and we've only got a couple minutes here left before we got to jump back, but, um, I'm concerned primarily because the vast majority of Alaskans is spoken. Uh, now, although Dunleavy didn't come out with specific cuts during the campaign, his overall theme was we need to cut the size and scope of government. We need to pay a full PFD. We need to take care of crime. Those were really his three messages. And the vast majority of Alaskans said, yes, that's what we want. Uh, yet we've got legislators, uh, you know, obviously in the House is in total disarray. But even in the Senate, people who are like not really down with that. I mean, you saw the reaction for the from the OMB director. You saw the <clears throat> you've seen the discussion and the talking points from senators who said, uh, you know, hey, if we only cut the PFD down to three hundred dollars, all our budget woes would be over. Um, you know, I mean, they are they are they are chomping at the bit to continue business as usual. And that's what scares me at this point. Yeah, I, um, they're going to test Dunleavy's resolve. Uh, they're going to take his budget, and they're going to do things to it and send it back to him. Then they're going to hold some stuff in reserve. They're not going to fully fund the PFD when it goes back to Dunleavy as sort of a, a, a negotiating ploy to, to offset his uh, 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 line-item vetoes. And, and I think we're going to go long, way long this year. Uh, we may be testing – you know, whether Alaska government shuts down by the time we get to July 1. But it's, it, it is a fundamental fight for the state. Then we came in with a, with a mandate to, to restore the PFD, to make some spending cuts. Legislators are looking out for their own particular interests. Lyman Hoffman's PCE, Click, Click Bishops, you know, work, the labor workforce uh, uh, things. Um, and we're going to have a clash of that. And, I, and I'm not sure where it's going to go, where it's going to come out. But I am fairly sure it's going to go. We're going to have a long, set, long sessions uh, in order to try to resolve it. And uh, does the public remember that come election time? That's my question. Does the well, public remember? Years, yeah, we're two years away from elections. These senators and representatives are counting on people having long forgotten it by the time we get to the 2020 election. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. As always, my friend, a true pleasure. Uh, I wish we could solve all the problems in uh, in 45 minutes, but unfortunately we can't. Thank you for coming on board and joining us today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.